You are tuning in to the Rockford News Network. This is Rockford Advocate Case Reports, Episode 2, recorded January 31st, 2017. With me, I have James Haggerty. I'm Jeff Orduno. Jim is with the Rockford Advocate, a uh, website that covers primarily local news in Rockford, but also covers some crime-type news in a broader sense. Jim, uh, I'm holding in my hand a letter. Uh, care to tell me what you know about this letter? Well, that, that's the letter that was uh, sent to me from a... Well, via a outlet that received it through the prison system in Wisconsin. It's from a gentleman who claims that Stephen Avery confessed uh, to the crime that he's uh, actually convicted for. And he is, of course, the subject of the Making a Murderer a documentary on Netflix. Yeah, so let's dial this back a yeah. second. So well, about a year ago, year and a half ago, maybe, Dece- Netflix... December 2015. December 15, Netflix released a documentary... Mm-hmm called Making a Murderer, yes. and that covered a uh, gentleman named Stephen Avery, yes. who had been convicted of murder, yep. and was it the documentarian's position that Avery was innocent of the murder, or did the documentarian have a position on it, or was it just telling the story? What happened? Well, I, I'm a little bit torn there. I haven't talked to the filmmakers, but Avery is one of these classic type of families that, that were largely outcast in the... Um, in the Manitowoc, Wisconsin area, everybody knew this guy as someone who has been in trouble, who had been in trouble. He actually did 22 years in prison for a rape that he didn't commit. But, you know, he was involved in some petty crimes like that. I think he was arrested for indecent exposure, just drunken foolishness type of thing. Well, his family now, was, when you say a rape he didn't commit, going back the, to right. the prior charge, not the one that was the primary subject of the documentary, right. uh, he was eventually exonerated by DNA evidence, right? He was. He was exonerated by DNA evidence, and uh, he had an alibi. I checked out. He wasn't. He, I don't even think he was anywhere near the crime scene when it happened. And, and it was a case of mistaken identity because the guy who actually did this was, I think, their first suspect. And it turned out he looked just like Avery at the time. Shaggy beard, shaggy hair. You know, young twenty-two-year-old drifter type guy who was who was eventually convicted of it. So most reasonable people were satisfied in their mind that Avery had been exonerated from that charge or that crime. I believe so. Yes, he became uh, somewhat of a celebrity in Wisconsin. I believe there was a, there was something called the Stephen Avery Law now, where I think. Um, it has to do with uh, um, suspects and the, the way suspects are investigated. I'd have, to, I'd have to look. But there is a law on the books now in Wisconsin that uh, basically tries to curb uh, unlawful convictions. And the central facts for all this took place in or around Manitowoc, Wisconsin, up towards Green Bay? Yep. I believe the Avery Salvage Yard is about a half hour from the town of Manitowoc. Yeah, so it's, it's right up there in the Green Bay, the Fox Valley area up there. Sure, towards, oh. up towards Appleton, Green Appleton, Bay. Green Bay, Oshkosh, yep. All right. Well, up from our perspective, sitting here in Rockford, Illinois. Absolutely. Anyway, so, Jim, uh, this documentary comes out. I heard a lot of media buzz about it. To be honest, I didn't watch it at the time. I've since seen some of it. What... uh, what brought you into having more direct knowledge of the case? Or more, not necessarily the case, but the situation? Well, being familiar with the area, it's not too far away from where I grew up, and and having people uh, cover this in the news at the time. I remember when this happened. Actually, I did remember the murder in 2005, but I do remember the court case in 2007. It was a captivating type of case in the area. Everybody everybody knows the Averys, first off, and everybody knew. I don't know if everybody knew the victim, but but they, it was a hugely sensational case up there, and I think they had, you know, Avery. He was a pretty much the ideal suspect. So I just became aware of it. It was in the back of my mind. Uh, people were talking about this guy. We killed this photographer, and you know. she was a photographer for a, an auto publication, yeah. auto classified classified publication. Right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And she her job was uh, as a freelance photographer was just to drive around and take pictures of cars for sale, collect money, and that those pictures would be in this in, in, the, in the magazine, which was um, I believe free at newsstands and gas stations, things like that. So it's it's still around. The, these publications are still around. So I became involved in it when when I I believe I got an email uh, because there was an attorney who actually appeared in the documentary that we knew from, or I knew, and some other folks and I knew from another murder case that happened in 2008 or something like that. That happened in the UP. Uh, the defendant was actually represented by this defense attorney who really was, um, I believe he was disciplined for how he handled the 
uh, Brendan Dassey portion of or his murder case was connected to this. You'll, you'll see this. So I became kind of interested just to see what his role in the documentary was. And then I just I, I was just like everybody else as well, just started, started to dig around in it a little bit because I do believe that there's an element of the, the filmmaker's take is that he didn't do it. He was railroaded not once but twice. And now things are starting to come out. Uh, the documentary documentary maker felt that the police kind of had it in for this guy. The prosecutor had it in for this guy. Or, well, I, want, that, I don't want to put words in the guy's mouth. That's but, another d- dramatic uh, element of the I documentary. Mean, you, you have uh, Stephen Avery spending 22 years. I think it's 22 years or 18 years. Avery anyway, spent almost, let's just say, 20 years in prison for a rape that he didn't commit. He filed a $36 million lawsuit against the county, uh, the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, and named two or three deputies. And then this girl turns up dead, and it's these two deputies that arrest him and, and, and kind of head up the initial investigation. And they're the ones who are ultimately accused of planting evidence in the case. There's a whole bunch of dramatic elements that um, are just kind of thrown at you in this documentary. The Manitowoc County Police were not, or Sheriff's Department was not supposed to be investigating the case because of conflict of interest. There was a special prosecutor from another county assigned to it. And all of them were just kind of portrayed as bumbling fools out to get Stephen Avery. Now, Avery was not the only person implicated in the, there was a rape and a murder, and it, Avery was not the only person implicated in that, right? Right. Well, the, the rape actually happened, or the, excuse me, the story of the rape came by way of his nephew's uh, confession, which has now been thrown out because it's been coerced. But yes, and his, it, his nephew's name is Brendan uh, Dassey? Brendan Dassey, the 16-year-old at the time. Um, and, and that's what they hinged the entire um, case on, according to the documentary. There was some physical evidence as well. But the real big uh, smoking gun, if you will, um, element, or excuse me, a piece of evidence that the prosecutor had was Brendan Dassey's confession. He confessed everything. He, he told it from start to finish how uh, he was uh, lured or asked to partake in, which was a sexual assault, which led to the murder of, of this girl. And then they covered up the body. They burned it. And that's all chronicled in the, in the um, documentary. But again, lawyer, uh, Avery's lawyers defended him based on the defense that he didn't do it. I mean, he just didn't do it. The bones were there. We don't know how they got there. Their bones were scattered around. We don't know how that happened. A key to this photographer's car, as people know, was found in, this, um, in his trailer, in his bedroom. Um, and had, it was actually found on, I think, a second or third visit by police to this bedroom, and then they might miraculously found it. And, of course, who found it were the, but one of the guys who he was suing and named in the lawsuit. So it's just a whole bunch of, stuff, a whole bunch of drama that, 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 that's connected to this case. It's, it's quite amazing. Now, since then, he has, Avery has hired uh, famed um, exoneration or post-conviction attorney Kath- Kathleen Zellner from Chicago. She's gotten off. Um, she's gotten a, a lot of people off on uh, DNA technicalities, um, alibi technicalities, things like that. And so she's taken on the case. There's a lot of. Well, it's not uh, really a technicality. I mean, if DNA exonerates somebody, they're exonerated, right? I suppose. I, I they, mean, they, they, within they reason. I, I suppose everything's subject to some right gaming at the edges, but. And, and so th- there are some testing being done. Uh, with regard to Avery. With regard to Avery, there's some blood that the documentary goes into great detail about the claims that it was planted. They claim that there was um, D- Avery's DNA planted um, you know, on the key. Uh, they, they claim there was some blood planted in the car. And they claim they got this blood that because it was on file from his previous case, and w- w- which was. There was a vial of blood on file at the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department that you know nice he claimed place. that they, they, they drew the blood out, smeared it around to make it look like he did. Then they had opportunity to do it. There wow. was absolutely no idea or no doubt about the fact that the police had opportunity to, to frame Steve Avery, but, but I guess the question is why? Why, why would they do that? Well, so that, that's out there as a possibility. Well, I guess he would probably say that they seem to have it in for him. I mean, he sued them for $36 million, right? Right, and, and during the middle of the initial stages of his case, they settled that lawsuit for $400,000, and of course it went to legal fees. So... Avery's position is he didn't do it, and he's trying to be exonerated. Dassey's position is that he his confession was coerced. Yeah, Dassey's position is a very interesting one because he chronicled the uh, sexual assault, uh, the killing, and the disposal of the body via a bonfire. 
And then he retracted everything. He, went, he actually went on the stand in the documentary, and there's some other transcripts out there where he just says, wait a minute, I made the whole thing up. Really? He made it up based on a, a novel called Kiss the Girls, which is, was made into a movie with Ashley Judd in it, starring uh, her, where... Did the facts track? Did the facts that he later said were fictitious track with the facts in the book? Do you, if you know, if you, uh, so you some know. of it did, yes. Yeah. So th- there was a scene in the book where I think a girl was tied to a bed in, in, in a way he described. Boy. But we come to find out that you know, the, all of this stuff could be possible. But he's maintained for the last 10, 11 years now that, that he didn't do it. And he just did this because he was coerced. And, and his entire interrogation is available online. I think I posted it on the website. So you can see that. Um, That's at rockfordadvocate.com? It is. And the police use a very famous technique called the Reed technique, which is used to extract uh, confessions. And it, 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 it used incorrectly, it can, it can be a, a, a tool to coerce somebody into t- saying things that you want them to say. You just basically lead, lead them into sometimes believing that, that they did something like that. And because Brendan Dassey was a... a learning disabled 16-year-old boy who I think he, they said he had a sixth grade uh, uh, intellect in, I think, sophomore or junior year in high school he was at the time. He was an easy target. So last fall, his conviction was vacated, but he's still sitting in prison, as you might know. All right. So that is kind of the nutshell version of the events that brings us to the letter that I'm holding in my the hand. The letter. That's an infamous so, letter. Today has been a kind of a a day of infamy. Well, in yeah, so, so I've got a letter, and it uh, purports to be from a guy named Joseph Evans, yes, who uh, claims to be an inmate that served time uh, in the same correctional facility as uh, Avery, Yep. and at various points. And what, uh, first of all, how did you get a hold of this letter? I got a hold of it from a channel um, who's headed up by individuals that had no use for it uh, for, for various reasons. So it was kicked to me, and the people who gave it to me knew I was uh, covering some of this stuff, sort of long-form stuff, and would be interested in at least seeing it because I've been um, confronted and have dug around in several different conspiracy theories connected to this case. There, there are stories that uh, the body of Teresa Halbach really wasn't her. They actually switched out the body, and they substituted um, the cremains of somebody from a mortuary, a crem- a, a mortuary mm-hmm. that had been cremated. Crematorium. A crematorium. There, there's been um, stories that she's still alive. There's stories that you know the, the police actually killed her. Uh, so all of this stuff has, n- has never checked out. Uh, th- th- all of these conspiracy theories have been debunked, and all of them are in direct contrast with what's in that letter, and the letter is pretty much along the lines of the, the original uh, prosecution. Now, I'll summarize today's events with you. I've been sure. with you for part of the day, so I've, I've uh, heard the calls come in. I was present while you did an interview with one of the Green Bay, uh, one of the local Rockford affiliates on behalf of the, one of the Green Bay stations. Mm. Um, so I know that there's some attention to this letter. It, you were a little vague, and I think intentionally so, about where this letter came from. I mean, so it's some source that has the letter, believes the letter is not necessarily the content, but that the, uh, I guess I'll call it the provenance of the letter or the, the existence of the letter, they believe that this letter did truly originate from... Joseph Evans, uh, I believe that's been Jr. Pro- yeah, I, I believe that's been proven that, that it's come from a, a man by the name of Joseph Evans, yes. Uh, as far as its contents, well, I, w- I don't know. I, I and, they, and they just don't, for whatever reason, they don't want to publish the letter. Right. And, and I think people are looking for, and I, and I do understand that position, that this guy could be a complete um, fool or a, a, a complete lunatic. He's a convicted murderer, so, so he's, people yeah, want to make sure that... He tells us is, very early in the, in the letter. The letter is in two parts, just so people know uh, I may be going back and forth here. There's kind of a handwritten preface that's uh, just over a page or a page plus some addressing information. Then there's another nine pages of uh, typed, uh, kind of single-spaced, uh, relatively average size. It looks like it's truly been typed on a typewriter, yep. um, and it's captioned... Uh, Teresa Hallbeck's murder told to me by Stephen Avery. Um, and it begins in September 2009 with his own conviction and kind of explains how he came into contact with Stephen Avery uh, per his own claim. And I'll, I'll say this right now, I'll say it right here. We, we don't know if this letter is real. We don't know if this letter is truthful. We don't know if any part of it is truthful. Well, the letter is real. It came well, from Evans. We don't know if well, the there, there is Well, there is a letter. We don't know... With the, about the veracity of anything in the letter. Right. Frankly, we don't know 100% sure, to be fair, 
I mean, you got this from what you consider a reliable source. Oh, yes. But we didn't get the letter from Joseph Evans. It did not come in an envelope from the uh, correctional institution to us. Oh, it did. Well, I just didn't us. see that. Well, it didn't come to us right. or you. Right. Okay. It, it came to me from the person who, um, who received it from Evans. And he did not keep the envelope because the police, the police seized it. And it's now part of a Department of Justice file on Stephen Avery. I do know that for a fact, and all of this information is FOIAable. I just didn't go that route because I don't have that kind of time. Even though it's an open investigation, um, you think it would still be subject to some flight? of it would be, but you know, I decided to run with it because even if I did get some of this, it would be so redacted, it, it, w- it would have been a waste of time. I've, okay. I've been down that road several times with with this uh, these types of cases, and in today's forensic science laden world of prosecuting cases, they, they don't release anything, and, and this is amazing that anyone's talking to me at all, really. All right, so this inmate named Joseph W. Evans, Jr., um, I'm going to summarize what he tells us for the reason for sending this. He uh, kind of has, I think, three reasons. The first one that he says is he's not asking for anything with regard to having written the letter other than that uh, the public acknowledged the victim and her family by giving a donation to a church or shelter or your favorite charity. Um, The second thing he identifies as a reason is that hopefully this will help in the decision for Brendan Dassey's case. So that would make the letter timely, I guess, in his mind. Um, Thirdly, he identifies closure for the family. And then I guess there's a fourth reason. Uh, He seems to have found God, would be my summary, and believes that uh, doing this is, uh, my words, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, sending this letter, passing this information on. So that's... Most of that is in the preface. Other parts of that are in the letter itself. Do you know what the date of this letter is, Uh, Jim? I don't know that it's on I believe it's mid-August. It's on page 9, 2016. Uh, Yep, August 25th, 2016, Waupon, Wisconsin, at the Waupon Correctional Institution. Mm -hmm. He's indicated that he typed this statement out himself, Joe Wayne Evans, Jr. So, all right. So that's kind of the preface. Um, this letter will be available uh, probably about the time this podcast is released uh, via rockfordadvocate.com. You'll have to go to the site to get the letter. Um, I'm just, you know, I don't think it does us a ton of good to try and put our words in where he's using his words, but I guess I would summarize the letter as saying that uh, Evans' position is that Avery confessed to Evans that Avery committed the murder. Right, and I, and I took it a little bit as Avery bragging a little bit on how he almost got away with murder if it wasn't for, you know, his, I think he calls him a stupid kid, um, calls Dassey. Brandon Dassey. You know, and th- they knew each other, and I, I've seen this type of thing before where uh, you know, one kind of notorious uh, murderer meets another one in jail, and they become friends. And it, it's in the letter where Evan says, I knew of Avery's case and he knew of my case, so we just kind of hit it off. We're both from Wisconsin. Um, Avery has ties to Marinette County because he vacationed, they had property there. This guy killed his wife in Marinette County. So they, they, they knew of one another. So all of a sudden, you know, they meet each other in prison and, and just, just started talking like a couple of um, Navy buddies, really, and Avery starts bragging is, is kind of is what this guy is claiming. I don't know that to be true, but it, it, it sounds to be like he's, he's describing a... Yeah, so it's, it sounds kind of like Avery talks to Evans about why Evans called the police. In the case of Evans, sure. uh, Rib- ribbing each other wife, a little bit. Yeah. You know, as Avery says, "Why did I call the police to report that I had just shot my wife? I told them that I had called nine one one seeking medical help for her because she needed it." Uh, but the police ended up coming there as well. So it it sounds like they they discuss Evans' murder right. uh, that he committed, uh, and, and then he he tries to get. Well, we'll get to that point. No, and then they go on to discuss uh, Avery's murder. Mm-hmm. Great detail. Yeah, this is, I will warn this, this letter is relatively graphic. Mm-hmm. I mean, the uh, not just necessarily the murder component, but there's a lot of uh, detail uh, regarding anatomy and exactly what happened during the rape, and that Evans is saying that this is what Avery told him yeah. in this regard. So I would warn everybody who may look at this. This thing is relatively graphic. Yes. Um, Evans, as the author, kind of says that he himself had some doubts about whether Avery was uh, blowing smoke up Evans' ass right. with some of the things he would say about the case, um, but that 
over time, essentially, it seems like he felt that Avery was being consistent when he rendered the story with, uh, from time to time. And, uh, quote, I almost felt like Stephen Avery needed to get this off his chest and out of his system and just talk to someone that he could trust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, so he questions Avery's motives. I mean, should we stop and question Evan's motives for a minute? We could. We well, could. I mean, he's, he's a guy, though, that I don't think is, is hiding it, the fact that he's a convicted murderer. He, he, go, he goes and, I think, talks about how um, he felt when he admitted that and kind of made his, um, his revelation to God as, as a Christian. I think he calls it, uh, um, he puts it that he became a Christian and, and he's, he's, he's free of his guilt and actually wanted that for Avery. Um, so I, I, I don't see... I don't see Aver, excuse me. I don't see Evans as a guy who is, you know, bragging how he got the raw end of a of a, of a false conviction. He admitted to being a convicted murderer, killing his wife right off the bat. Yeah, I, I don't see where he seems to be asking for anything no. other than what he said in the preface. Uh, anyway, he what could he get? He's, yeah, he, it doesn't seem like there's a plea available for him or any sort of. Maybe there is. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Maybe for this goes in the hopper of reasons to let a guy out early if right. he well, dimes somebody else out. I don't know. I, I, I don't and know. testifies and, against And I'm him. sure there, there's some privileges in prison that, that might be considered privileges. <laughs> you know, I guess another option would be that Evans wants his notoriety. That could Avery's be. gotten could notoriety, be. and now Evans wants notoriety. Well, and, that, and that could be. And, and I've had a lot, of, a lot of naysayers out there. I don't know what I'm talking about. I think I've been accused. I was accused a couple of times of creating a letter myself. Um, but one of the things I asked is, you know, first of all, did, did Evans, was, was Evans there with Avery? I found out, yes, he was. Um, did they know each other? Yes. The, the, these two were very well-known uh, murderers. Um, now, they, they weren't very as well-known as Avery has become. But in Wisconsin, where they were, people I'm guessing uh, people knew of these. I'm guessing guys. murderers, yeah, you know, uh, are a relatively small club in well, yeah, in, a, in, in Marinette Wisconsin. County, yeah. in Marinette County, Wisconsin, which is it's a large county, but it's a, you know it's, it's rural, and you know, there's not a lot of killings up there, and people kill their wives up there. And what happens down here? It's big news. So they people knew of these guys. All right, so. I don't know. I mean, we don't know what Evans' motivations no, for this may be that aren't things that he's articulated that are, uh, let's say, less, uh, less ideal. So, but uh, I'm holding what appears to be a letter from this guy, so yep. I will uh, <laughs> I'll keep talking about it for a minute. So out of nine typed pages, I would say that Evans allocates a couple of pages to uh, explaining how he got to know Avery and what the setup was for these discussions, you know, how he would have these conversations with Avery and uh, just kind of how the relationship worked. He spends a little time talking about uh, uh, the God thing. He talks uh, briefly about Avery's brother, and uh, we'll maybe come back to that in a minute. And then he spends pretty much, the, and that gets to about fourth page, and then he spends pretty much the balance of the letter going through the uh, unfortunately graphic and gory details of what uh, Evans says Avery said he did uh, and that uh, Dassey did. So anyway, back to uh, the brother issue. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you have some knowledge about well, it. In the it documentary, came from the documentary. In the documentary, there, there's some contention between Avery's brother and, and Avery himself. Um, there, there was some suggestion on the Internet that there's you know a possibility that his brother may have done this one of his brothers but it, it, none of that has has panned out but uh, but um, Evans goes into how Avery allegedly told him that um, he initially planned on pinning it on his brother because of some sort of money deal that went bad and if you know so but then the Brendan Dassey thing came about and it, it looks to me like Evans was hearing a story and if he did hear this story it kind of unfolds like it like um, Avery was all set to pin it on whoever he was going to pin it on, in this case, his brother. Now, does he really say that... The, the part I'm looking at here is that, quote, Steve would seem to have a lot of hatred for a brother of his for some reason. Then Evans goes on to say, uh, Steve would always say that the police should have charged his brother with the crime and not him, even though Steve committed the crime himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a direct quote from Evans. Right. That's not me. Yeah, and, if you, and if you look, so, he, he goes on to say he... But but then it said he just he decided to just go with the fact that he was framed. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, at that point, then Evans tees up the whole 
basically the details yeah. of what he purports Avery told him happened. And then uh, he talks a little bit about um, kind of the relationship in, uh, from at the aspect of being transferred to Waupon, so a uh, correctional facility and things like that. And that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Yes. I mean, I don't, we'll put this out there for people to see, and they can draw their own conclusions about whether it's real or not. Mm-hmm. Well, Jim, what do you feel? You you feel a trail. You feel this came from Joseph W. Evans Jr. Oh yes, I mean I know that. Do I do I one hundred percent believe the content of the letter? I I don't know. I, I believe that a lot of it follows the chrono- the chronology of the prosecution's timeline. There, but there are some holes that are filled in with some information that I don't think everybody knew. So I think there's information in there that not not everybody knows except probably the Department of Justice who has so th- this. And, and I ha- I I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, Kathleen Zellner has a copy of this letter as well. So do we, should we, should we, might we, may we probably assume that somebody, some investigators following up to see if the, what's said in this letter is, if the holes that Evans plugs in, um, if those make sense? Uh, I would think so. But, uh, and all of this is in light of, of forensic testing. I mean, there, there might be some forensic testing that comes back that could grant him a new trial or grant him an exoneration for that matter. And... You might have a murderer on the streets. I don't know. So what's your understanding of Brendan Dassey's status sitting here today? Well, Dassey was uh, was not exonerated. His conviction was vacated on the grounds that his um, confession was unconstitutional, was coerced. So at this point... Um... Uh, he was ordered released uh, by uh, at the state level, and then the Seventh Circuit blocked that. He's sitting in jail. The ruling is he will stay there until the state of Wisconsin either decides to not charge him or he's found innocent. So the, until the appeals process is completed, he stays right where he is. All right. So, I mean, is that technically mean he is a suspect in a murder case or is it, does he have some other sort of legal status being the fact that he was just convicted of I'll have to crime. read that and figure out what I think the Seventh right. Circuit decision tells me about what he what his status is. So, Jim, I know you have another time commitment. I want to let you get out of here. Uh, I think that about covers everything that we would say about that letter. Uh, people will be able to find that letter from uh, that we believe is from Joseph W. Evans, Jr. Where? RockfordAdvocate.com, probably below um, a, this, this video. The video of this interview? All right, RockfordAdvocate.com. It'll be, it'll be in the form of a story, and this will be on Rockford News Network as well. All right, you can get the link to the Rockford Advocate from the RockfordNewsNetwork.com. Uh, turning to next week, I know we were going to cover it this week, but I uh, got this uh, somewhat preempted our other story. Uh, next week, what do you have in the hopper for us? Well, we've been looking at the Jennifer Locke Miller case. Jennifer Locke Miller, young lady a- murdered in the early 90s, oh, yes. resulted in a conviction for Alan Beeman mm-hmm. of Rockford, who was later exonerated. And is now a free man. Free man. And murder remains unsolved. It does. It certainly does. And there's a lot of holes there, but there's also a lot of a lot written about this uh, you know, in, in the uh, in the annals, uh, as they say. Well, yeah, because uh, actually, similar to Avery, uh, Beeman went on and from Avery's first conviction, Beeman went on and uh, has filed various suits against some of the prosecutors, police, uh, and other people, and. That uh, has borne out other information. And some of that is very interesting um, stuff. And there, there's four other, three other suspects. Okay. There's other suspects. Any, any other links to Rockford besides Beeman? Yeah, there appears to be, yes. And again, j- just to say that, of course, the Jennifer Locke Miller murder, um, aside from Alan Beeman, you know, it may seem like a Bloomington case, not a local case, but there, there is still a tie to Rockford here that, that we're probably going to have to uncover. I mean, we, we can't, it's one of those cases where we can't really dig into this thing without kind of making that part of everything. It's an integral part of the, well, it was an integral part of the investigation. It's, it appears to be rearing its head as such now. I mean, to, to me, there, there, there's, there's some untied, tied up ends there. All right. Well, we'll look forward to that next week. Jim Haggerty of RockfordAdvocate.com. Thank you so much. And that concludes this episode of Rockford Advocate Case Reports.